Hello and welcome to a new segment from D6 Damage. This is Bonus Damage, where the Dice Bag crew and I are going to be talking about stuff we like, uh, be it movies, video games, anime, whatever, and how exactly that can inform on your next game of Pathfinder, D&D, or your tabletop of choice. Today, I'm joined by D10. Good day. And we're talking about one of our favorite formative animes, Full Metal Alchemist. Or Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood for some of you ma uh, for some of you anime purists. Yes, or even the manga for any of you like really hardcore people. Yeah. Honestly, of all the shows I watch, I think I wanna get a complete set of the uh full me- full metal manga before I start collecting anything else. So, I think the first question that any of us ask watching Full Metal Alchemist is, how exactly would you play an alchemist? It's right there in the title. It's the thing everyone wants to run. How do you do it? I mean, I feel like Pathfinder would almost make you want to say, oh, well, we have the alchemist class, but that's more actual alchemy, not anime alchemy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, you definitely have a point there. Yeah, that's more, you know, I'm going to sit around and brew potions and plan extensively what I'm going to do. Uh, in Full Metal Alchemist, it's a lot faster. Also, there's so much a lot more... Fancier. Yeah, there, there's also so much more variety with the yeah. various different kinds of alchemists. Yeah, which would then make someone consider... Maybe they're all just wizards and flavoring their magic in a particular way. I yeah, also well, think you could also argue for some of the more martial alchemists, like Alex Louise Armstrong or Ed, or even oh God, what was his? What was that one alchemist that got jobbed out to Scar when he was first introduced? The Iron Blood alchemist. Oh yeah, that was Brigadier General Grand, the Iron Blood alchemist. Such a yeah, like I. Name. I yeah, like, I'd, I'd consider them maybe artificers uh, from 5e as well. Yeah, that wouldn't be a, a bad pick. Um, Roy's definitely, like, some kind of evocation-focused sorcerer. Just really specialized in fire damage. Oh, yeah, and you see all the meta magic to get all the versatility he can out of that one energy type. Maybe he's just, like, a warlock who made a deal with, like, an Ifrit or some other fire-focused thing. Okay, you'll have a limited spell slot, as long as it's not raining. Well, that that doesn't seem like a bad... that bad? <sighs> Shit. Immediately starts raining. <laughs> Why did I have to pick such a common weakness like water? Yeah. I don't know, maybe you could probably work out Eldritch Knight as an alchemist as well... But that's a much more limited form of alchemy. You know, for Ed specifically, something like, uh, what is it, the Pact Blade Warlock, where you get the weapon that you can actually, like, change the form of? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, the yeah Pact of the Blade. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, I would say the one who's actually most like a Pathfinder alchemist would be the Sewing Life alchemist. Oh, uh, Marco? Yeah, yeah. You know, because he, he makes all, like, the abominations and stuff. Wait. Oh, yeah, I was wrong. That's not Marco. That's fucking... Sh- that's fucking Shao Tucker. Sorry, I was... Marco's the one that... That, uh, that perfected the Philosopher's Stone yeah, research. Yeah. I can see... that. I can see exactly why I confused the two. Yeah, they do kind of blend together. Well, they're both also biological-based alchemists. Which also is just, like... Which, I guess you could make an argument for a cleric to be an alchemist in that way. That would, that would be an interesting take on it. You know, they could conceivably get a lot of, like, the, the healing stuff out of it. Yeah. And, you know, dealing with, like, living things. Yeah, but then this is definitely a campaign setting. God. Say so of no more vivify, no raise dead. I mean, I believe the god of all alchemists is just science. Yeah, the the god is equivalent exchange. Mm-hmm. And nothing else. It's it's a lawful neutral god. Some may argue true neutral. 
Yeah, I think it would be like yeah. some kind of grand principle or philosophy for uh, the role of God for that particular cleric. Moving away from the alchemist, because I feel like we've tapped the well they're pretty dry, dry, unless I'm forgetting a very specific alchemist that is unlike any of the others. But like, Riza Hawkeye has got to be like a gunslinger, if not a fire. If not just a straight up fighter, yeah, some type of uh, firearm focus something. Gunslinger would be good. How would you feel about Ranger? That could work. She does I get think a dog. My... <laughs> yes, but the dog is a ma- is a mascot and not actually and not actually health health only combat. Fair. So that way, she's like a five E Ranger. Ba bunch. I've yet to actually look at Tasha's Cauldron's Beastmaster. Maybe they changed it. Maybe it's got better. I don't know. Ranger could work. I I don't know. I guess I'm just gonna say here, like, does she really utilize those kinds of those kinds of skills and specialties in the show? Yeah, that's that's a tough one. She really is just mostly like, into the weapon. Like the best thing I can think of her tracking is She's always able to find Mustang somehow. So, like, maybe she just has a permanent Hunter's Mark on him. Uh, in one e, maybe she has a uh, favorite enemy boss. <laughs> Another exciting one uh, would be Scar. Yeah, so first thought is Monk. Unfortunately, Monk doesn't get anything nearly that cool of a... Well, okay, I've never made a Pathfinder Monk. And in 5e, there... Other than the quivering palm technique, uh, Oath of the Open paw, uh, Palm archetype, they don't really have a one hit and you're dead attack. Yeah. Yeah, there aren't that many of those in uh, in Pathfinder. Maybe, uh, God, what was the one Unearthed Arcana class, like the Mystic, where you got to add like a butt ton of extra psychic die into one attack? Well, yeah, that's why I, I was kind of... I think before we were recording, I was thinking, oh, he he's a Hexblade Warlock monk, and his packed weapon is his arm. And so that way he could get in close, do one strike, and spend, and spend a Warlock spell slot to do Eldritch Smite, which it's basically like Divine Smite, but for Warlocks. And it's I think it's like the 10s instead of the 8s, and if you're huge or smaller, you get knocked on your ass. Nice. No save. Uh, D8 uh, seemed to work out a pretty good system for Scar where uh, it was like a touch spell sorcerer and you just dump everything into Shocking Grasp. Yeah, that could work as well. Maximize Shocking Grasp. Yeah, it would be like maximized and whatever the... Uh, I think it's Intensify, which adds... Yeah, Intensify is so fun. Yeah, one of the best metamagic feats. You could also maybe say that Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, another way you could do this is maybe do uh, Rogue Monk. Since your fists are a monk weapon and you go off of uh, dexterity instead of strength, I think almost any DM would be willing to say your unarmed strike counts a, would count towards sneak attack. Uh, what about Ling and, his, Ling and his bodyguards? Oh, yeah. How would you do or, that? Uh, what was her name? What was her name? Uh, May, the the one with the tiny panda. I I remember the character, but yeah, the name is escaping me. Yeah, sorry, FMA fans. Been a while. <laughs> she, I could see like probably an arcade trickster. Ooh, that would be fun. And Ling just screams fighter rogue to me, if not College of Swords rogue, since he's real. Since he's really fast, really graceful. Actually, yeah, the more I'm remembering him, Bard probably fits him better than just straight up fighter. Because mm. he's always always runny his mouth. And had even and had so high a persuasion role he was able to give it convince greed to turn on his father. Which honestly maybe that wasn't as high as did, as a DC as a, as I was thinking. Yeah, Greed's uh, not much of a joiner, if you think about it. Yeah. But that does uh, bring up, uh, FMA does have a couple of interesting human-adjacent races uh, that are distinct and different from, you know, the typical elves and orcs we see in uh, fantasy games. Stuff like the hybrids and the chimeras. I mean, chimeras, you, 
could just say are the D and D stat block chimeras, just flavored differently to have different aesthetics. Yeah, I think Pathfinder has the Skinwalkers, which have the different animal versions. So it would be like yeah, and Five E I think has uh, the Shifters. Hold on, I'll double check that term. Yeah, they're just called the Shifters, which are Five E's equivalent of. Here's the best we're going to give you for giving you playable lycanthropes and other thropes like werebears, were tigers, were wolves. What you could do if you wanted to build sort of an FMA esque setting is you could take all of the more like beastly races like the Arcoke, or the <sighs> Dragonborn, and just say, uh, yeah, they were made with alchemy. That'd be a hell of an alternate timeline. Yeah, that would. But yeah, uh, could you remind me on who the hybrids are? Because uh, so in- as for the chimeras, all I can remember are like Greed's gain, and then like those two guys that uh, Kimberly had with him. Uh, yeah, oh my god, we forgot the, Kimberly. That's basically the hybrids. The chimeras look pretty human, but get some extra bits. Yeah, we kind of forgot to stat out Kim uh, to give a character class to Kimberly because I don't think wizard or sorcerer does him justice. Oh really? What would you uh what would you go with for him? I don't know. Like I don't know, maybe this is the kind of guy where it's just like, no, he's not a player character because he's just so powerful and just so twisted he has to be a boss monster. <laughs> it's kinda hard to personify a single energy into his crimson alchemy, Ooh, I think yeah. it it's called. Like it's destructive, it's big so it's not necrotic but it's certainly not i don't know maybe it's almost force damage it's like some weird like mix of necrotic and force damage yeah that would be unpleasant uh speaking of boss monsters i think we do have a little to work with uh if you wanted to have the homunculi as a race uh something like the either the reborn or isn't there another like undead ish Kind of race? Uh, the Dampier? Yeah. Well, some of them have kind of a Dampierish look to them, at least. Oh, no, I think you're thinking of uh, the... What are they called? The Hexbloods? Hold on, it's in Van Richten's guide. Uh, for those of you looking for uh, 5e content that you haven't already gotten, Van Richten's guide is totally awesome. It's got a lot of cool stuff, especially if you're into the whole Ravenloft gothic horror in D&D scene. Yeah, and it's great to help expand what you already have. Uh, expand maybe some of those finer points in your Curse of Strahd game. Or at least I believe that was the idea when they released it. You know, since Van Rick- Richten, I'm actually kind of on the fence whether or not I like the College of Lore Bard or the College of Spirits Bard better. Because they're both so mm. good. Why can I not find this book? Uh, says it's got... Oh, uh, yeah, the... He- yeah, I was thinking of the Hexblood. Yeah, yeah, the ones who are, you're, what, part hag, right? Yeah, considered part hag. Yeah. But yeah, the Reborn, and I think uh, even, I don't know, if you're more of a Critical Role fan, I think they have something called uh, the Remnant. Oh, yeah, I think I've seen that. So, moving on from characters to locations, Full Metal Alchemist, uh, they go to a lot of cool places, and they're kind of, uh, they're not globe-trotting, I'd say, but they definitely trot around a pretty large area. Yeah, I think you see almost every part of Amestris, almost. Like, I don't think we actually see any of the Eastern Front. But one of the most striking locations is obviously Fort Briggs. Oh, yeah, like, that's probably going, like, even though Icewind Dale is nothing like it, I probably would take take a lot of inspiration from it for, for running that area. Yeah, like, it's got this giant fortification out there. Scary stuff out there. Oh, yeah. And just abandoned mining towns. Yeah, and that's, a, that's another one where it would be cool to work in some of the elemental, like, condition rules where, you know, uh, don't you take, like, exhaustion if you're exposed to the weather too much? Uh, yes. If you're exposed if you're exposed to extreme weather of hot or cold, I think it's like an hour increments. 
and the and you have to keep passing con saves. Yeah, those can build up. And it just gets like Yeah, it just gets incrementally harder with each passing save. Uh, endure elements, people. Don't forget it. It matters. Uh, but to uh, go back to the east, you know, we do uh, find out at least some things about, like, the uh, Ishbalan war zone, which a lot of stuff definitely seems to happen there. And not to forget uh, the... You know, I, I feel like calling it the ruins of Xerxes is a bit generous, since it's literally just the wall of Xerxes at that point. And who can forget Rush Valley? Yeah. I would say one of my favorite uh, locations with a real dungeon atmosphere in Full Metal Alchemist are the secret labs, like Lab 5. Yeah, or like when they're investigating the uh, giant tu- tunnel under Briggs, or in uh, Leto? No, that was the name of the dumbass god. Uh, well, the tunnel also runs under that city that they started out in, oh, yeah, that I don't remember. But yeah, with uh, with those, there's definitely like a cool aspect of finding the dungeon that they're going into. So you know, you got to find this thing, and then you have to investigate it because uh, you know sometimes uh, in D and D games, or Pathfinder games, things like finding the dungeon aren't given enough focus. You know, uh, I could see that. Yeah. I mean, I think in some modules, you literally just stumble upon the entrance to the dungeon. Yeah, I think that's uh, how um, how the uh, Tomb of Annihilation got run the first time I went to it. Weird, because isn't that... Wait, the Tomb of Annihilation with uh, Incholt? Yeah, it, it was a weird kind of homebrew thing. Okay, then. Well, I mean... If you ever read the Tomb of Annihilation, getting into it is kind of a weird thing altogether. Like, the base way to get in is by voluntarily being captured and stripped of all your items. It's always a good idea when that happens. Right? So what's in the party? Uh, Sorcerer, monk, rogue, the use anything ability so it can hit people over the head with a rock and still get sneak attack? I mean, technically sorcerers still need arcane foci. So FMA also has a lot of really cool items uh, that the characters are either trying to get their hands on or are literally their hands. Uh, The point is, auto mail is cool. So cool. So uh, if you're interested in looking at like the Eberron setting, they have a lot of things like the construct limbs and the things that would be good substitutes for auto mail. Like rules as written... Technically, you can't do, like, the arm blade weapons uh, with your prosthetic. Like, that's specifically a Warforce exclusive thing. But come on. Yeah, come on. It'd be so cool. Pathfinder also has things like artificial limbs, but they also have graphs, which are a little more drow Icky. alchemy body horror than the auto mail is. But that's something you can always reflavor. This was in the cell. Uh, those are cult books, weren't they? Uh, they're in, I think, Horror Adventures. Yeah, that that was around where I jumped off in Pathfinder. Like, yeah. That. It's like, do you want eye stalks? Not really. No. Not at all. But you could look behind yourself. Uh, nah, I'm good. I'll just turn my head. Right? Obviously, one of the most big and important items in Full Metal Alchemist is the Philosopher's Stone. Which is kind of an endgame thing. Yeah, but we can't help but see it in some form or another all fucking show. Yeah, yeah, they're like the uh, the super unrefined version, which is just like the red water. Then there are like the incomplete versions, which we, I think, see like in the uh, the opening couple of episodes. Yeah, and then the ones that uh, keep the uh, homunculi alive. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think are more truly refined are Philosopher's Stones. Yeah, I think those are like, if not the complete one, like the more complete one. And then you have the two walking Philosopher's Stones. Spoiler alert. Ah, uh, true that. Uh, but uh, for the, the Philosopher's Stones, you have a number of different you know magic items that could fill sort of a similar role, like uh, Pearls of Power. Uh, Pearls of Power are in uh, fi- 5e as well, limited to third level, but uh, I forget where they 
where they introduced them, but they have these things known as spell gems, which are like, I think, go from jet to diamond, and they have arcane energy in them to give you free spell slots. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, they have the Sorcerer Shards, which when you use them as a foci, give you additional things along with when you use your metamagic feat. Like the one from the far plane lets you make like a, a tentacle attack. Oh yeah, and one that's I think literally a shard, a refined shard of the Astral Sea. Uh, whenever you use a, use metamagic, you just get a free teleport within 30 feet. Yeah. Which are really cool, and I guess you could also lump the Date Alchemist watches in here as well. Well, yeah, because uh, when they crack one open, doesn't it just have like a bunch of the red stones in there? That was the original anime. Ah. Okay, either Studio Bones skipped that in FMAB for sake of covering other things, or that was just original anime only. Either way, the State Alchemist watches would have a, a similar sort of effect to them. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you really wanted to be creative with how you use them, you could even lump Ion Stones as part of the Philosopher's Stone. Yeah, like the Philosopher's Stone just being a pearl of pa- power, Ion Stone, and the Sorcerer's Stones all in one. Because, yes, the the final version of the Sorcerer's Philosopher's Stone is that fucking broken. Well, yeah, it has to be if it's got such extreme crafting requirements. Oh, yeah, like, uh, a, a, what was it, a mil? A hundred souls, at least? You know, if you think about it, the entire anime is just someone trying to make a really over-the-top craft check. You're not wrong. <laughs> so, I think that moves us along to some of the creatures, monsters, and beings that could serve as enemies in a Full Metal-inspired D&D game. Uh, one of the ones that you know we see early on, and he's one of the main characters, and we just love him to death, is a soul in armor, i.e. Ed. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Well, Alphonse. Oh, you're right. It is Al. Ed Al. Damn it, why do you have to have such similar names? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. E-D, as opposed to A-L. Don't they know I memorize things with the number of letters? <laughs> but yeah, Alphonse Elric, uh, Barry the Butcher, and those two brothers that Ed fought that I don't remember the name of right yeah, now. Yeah, but they're both in the same suit of armor. Yeah, which was such a fucking pull. Yeah. <laughs> But, like, they, I mean, you could make them golems, but that doesn't really fit. Like, let's face it, these are probably the closest thing we've seen in anime to Warforged. I mean, I feel like there's something else even closer, because Warforged don't need the soul of another living being. Like, they just get their own soul from the from the anvil of the world. You know, I thought you were going to make a Warhammer reference and call it the Soul Forge, which is where we get soul grinders from. I mean, yeah, like, I I, I, I mean, Anvil of the World might just be another fantasy pull that I'm, for, that I'm forgetting of. But, like, yeah, it's it's where souls are initially created in D&D cosmology. But yeah, Warforge wouldn't be bad. Uh, some kind of construct. Um Something like, I think we do have just animated suits of armor. Although, those don't really have a soul. They're more just animated by magic. Yeah, why I was saying golems don't fit either. Because, one, not suits of armor. Two, two not intelligent or, sa- or sapient. But yeah, I, I think we are zeroed in on some type of really cool construct. Yeah. I guess to transfer to another enemy, let's face it, you can't think... Full Metal Alchemist enemies and not think of the seven hum- the seven homunculi. Yes. The seven very special homunculi, but there are also things a little lower down. The artificially created human tree there, such as the mannequin soldiers. Ah, uh, yes. Who share a lot of qualities with zombies, but are yet not zombies. I mean, that actually might be a good workaround of using zombies in your game if you have somebody that's very uh, 
ick towards the actual aesthetic of zombie. Yeah. But I mean, the mannequin soldiers are certainly in their own way kind of creepy, but uh, I think the uh, the alchemist class in Pathfinder does get a discovery that lets them make alchemic zombies. Really? Yeah. It's one of the ones that got added uh, way later to the discovery list. And let me guess, probably 12 level at least? Yeah, you gotta be at least level 12 before you can take that discovery, I'm almost sure. Yeah, I was about to say, that'd be kind of broken for early to mid-game. Yeah, so, but if you're looking for something alchemy-themed that's, you know, lower level and something for your players to just kind of cleave through, uh, something like zombie mannequin soldiers... Uh, would be a good thing to throw in a dungeon somewhere. Yeah, and I think the main reason why I'm zeroing on zombies is because in 5e, I'm not sure if they actually have this. And Pathfinder's been forever since I looked at one of those monster cards. They also have something called Undead Fortitude, meaning even if you drop them to zero, there's a chance they're not actually going to drop unless they take radiant damage. Yeah, I don't think uh, Pathfinder has one of those, at least not for zombies. With them, it's usually... Or am I thinking of ghouls? Maybe ghouls. I guess sworn zombies also had that. Yeah, but obviously the seven homunculi are the iconic enemies from Full Metal Alchemist, and you could get a lot of mileage out of any one of them. Like, you know, we could probably do a whole build, like, on how you would do, like, gluttony. You know, he would need swallow... Or envy, or... Yeah, Swallow Hole mixed with, uh, like, uh, the Donjon ability of some other, like, I think it's called the Astral Dreadnought. Oof. Yeah, I gotta put stuff in that pocket dimension. <sighs> yeah. But yeah, Envy uh, would have, like, the shape-changing ability. Uh, I'm sure there's a universal monster rule of, like, the ability to change forms. Uh, with him, you could actually do, like, I think it's the, the Metamorph Shifter, where you get the ability to look like different things. It's like based on the druid uh, thousand faces ability. Yeah. And once you down, down him to a certain level of HP just turns into like his gargantuan hellish multi-faced monster form. Yeah. That's always a a nice twist in the middle of a fight where the thing you thought you were fighting just reveals that it was something completely different. Well, it's just like, up to that point, it's just like, okay, so Envy can shapeshift, that's cool and all, but once you get past that, that there's nothing really threatening about about them as opposed to greed or gluttony or wrath or fucking lust. And then it turns into, and then it turns into a grotesque Godzilla. Well, that's terrifying. You know, King Bradley would be an interesting one because he's less interesting with his abilities. He's just like, really good at stabbing you in one spot. He's easily a Battlemaster fighter that has, like, God, I don't I don't even know what the fuck you would stat his, quote-unquote, ultimate eye on. But, like, just off the top of my head, like, you can see, like, you can see imperfections in people's fo- forms and know just when to strike. So, by Pathfinder terms, you're always attacking via flat-footed or on touch. What about something like a swashbuckler rogue in there? Yeah. He certainly could do sneak attack damage, and quite a bit of it. And don't need you to be distracted to do it. (laughs) Another one that I would say probably has levels in Rogue would be Lust, because uh, she does a lot of damage with the ultimate spear. Yeah, but as uh, Mustang points out, if you can can uh, out-speed her, you can basically kill her. Yeah. Also, that, what, 80 fireballs uh, also works. Yeah, yeah. Quick and spell, quick and spell, quick and spells, quick and spell. Yeah, and greed, uh, honestly, honestly, at the end of the day, kind of seems the most bore. Kind of seems the most boring. Well, actually, no. Sloth is the most boring. <laughs> Since greed has, like, the ultimate ar- armor. Like, he's super dexterous, and he's still... And you still can't hit him if you land a decent blow. You know, for him, I would almost want to run him as a, like, barbarian monk hybrid. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Because, you know, he's got so much damage mitigation. And he's also, you know, hard to hit. Yeah. Uh, Sloth, I think, is just a straight-up barbarian. 
like he's a big man with big muscles, and it ta- and it takes the full strength of two Armstrongs and uh, good old Mizu- Mizumi's husband to take him down. You know, this is one of the ones where uh, the two different animes, uh, the original and Brotherhood, sort of depart because uh, they have a different sloth. I think the homunculi make more sense, like their origins at least, in Brotherhood, where they all kind of come from father, whereas uh, in the original, it's just, you know, failed human transmutations that Dante just kind of collects. Dante? That that was the name of the big bad guy in the original anime? Okay. Go, go, and, follow, uh, go and follow the Inferno reference there, even though... Nothing in the show had anything to do with Dante's Inferno. Yeah, yeah, it it doesn't quite hold up near the end as much as you would like. Oh, trust me, I remember watching the finale one time when I was younger, and I think it was just playing on Adult Swim ran- randomly, so like episodes were playing in random, and just like, oh, and now Ed and Hohenheim are. In war torn Germany, <laughs> yeah, post yeah. World War One, almost World War Two. Some weird reveal about alchemy is fueled by people who die in this world? Question mark. What? <laughs> yeah, we we got got real crazy there at the end. Yeah, like that's almost crazier than Trigun's ending. Oh man, you know, anime has some crazy endings. Yeah, and then they have, and then they have fine and uh, really good endings that make sense, like Cowboy Bebop. Or at least sure. I guess that ends more ambiguous. Uh, but back to uh, FMA. What is what is original FMA sloth? Original FMA sloth is actually uh, Ed Nell's mother. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah, so uh, what uh, Dante does is uh, finds her, feeds her a bunch of the, the red stones, and she can, like, uh, turn into water. Okay, but what does that have to do with the sin of sloth? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, they don't, yeah, they, there's a spectrum of the amount that they take uh, from their namesake. Like, gluttony's kind of all about it. Uh Lust, lust is literally so the epitome. I don't know. I feel like lust is the the aesthetic epitome of modern lust. Oh uh, yeah, she she is. Uh, she certainly looks the part, but she doesn't really do anything. She's tempting people. I guess. I mean, she's a new. I mean, she's literally t- she's literally playing from the noir femme fatale handbook. Uh, yeah. Seduce them, kill them. <laughs> but what you're seducing them with? Hmm, that's the question. Yeah, yeah. It's really just hey. Uh, Envy is just Envy plays it on their goddamn sleeve. At least what I remember. I don't remember how they play him up in the original FMA. Uh, in the original, but he literally FMA, can't he's go more. Uh, the Envy part really comes in with how he feels about Hohenheim and Ed. Because mm. he, he is yeah. Because I was about to say like yeah. Because in uh, FMA B, he just envies humanity, and he can't go two seconds without insulting them. Mm. I don't know. Is King Bradley all that angry? I guess he is. I mean, he. I believe he in FMA Brotherhood is the epitome of cold, calculating wrath, not just furious. Not just furious and raging, but also able to meticulously break you down, if break you down, and take you out in the most painful way possible. And then there's pride. Yeah, actually, before we move on, in the 2003 version, Wrath is one of the ones that they changed. Uh, they made Bradley pride. I can see some of the reason for that, considering he's the head of state, and a lot of guys have a lot of pride about that. Yeah. But I, I'm i sorry. I look at one Wrath fight scene from FMA Brotherhood, and it's just like, nah, this makes more sense. Yeah, and the original Whereas, Wrath, like some, some weird evil kid. 
Oh yeah, yeah. It was supposed to be uh yeah, it was supposed to be Teacher Mizumi's kid, I think. Yeah. Which okay. <laughs> I think that's where the original anime was losing me. Yeah. Yeah, Pride in FMA Brotherhood is Celine Bra is Celine Bradley. This kid that has not aged since the beginning of this country the beginning of this country's founding and has been the Fuhrer's son for the last three hundred years. And I do mean each and every Fuhrer. And him being the oldest homunculus has probably the most insane weapon slash power to just use shadows to kill you. Hmm. Isn't there like a, a shadow so if you're in... or something? I know there's a shadow sorcerer. <laughs> Uh, Shadow Monk, Shadow Sorcerer, I mean, he, there's not that, I don't think any of them actually weaponize the shadows, they're more like utilizing the shadows as what they are, like Shadow, like, uh, Shadow Monk is basically like, uh, uh, like a shit, uh, the closest thing to Shadow Dancer I've seen, seen in 5e, where it's just like, okay, I slip into the shadows, and I teleport here. Hmm. And Shadow Sorcerer, you know, he might be a Shadow Sorcerer. I, I have not actually seen that in... Oh, wait, they do get, like, a a combat familiar, like a yeah, Shadow Yeah, the, uh, the hound tiger. that they can summon. Yeah, which I guess you could flavor into Selene Shadows, which also doubles for why, and if you get past his Shadows, you basically got him. Yeah, that's another yeah. thing about the... Uh... The fights in FMA, there's a pretty specific, like, exploit for each of the bosses. Don't ask me what, what Rath's exploit is, I still don't know to this day. Uh, doesn't look like but, Shadow Sorcerer gives you anything, like, super, like, shadow-specific. Uh, you get Dark Vision, you get the, the Spooky Hound. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, let me just pull it up real quick. Shadow Magic. Uh, yeah, you basically get Drow Dark Vision out to 120 feet. You can, uh, you get Darkness for free. And if you spend two sorcery points, you can just see through that darkness. Uh, apparently you can also just not die when you take damage and make a charisma saving throw to stay alive. Well, that's pretty cool. I love not dying. Yeah. Then there's the Hound of Ill Omen. Uh, Shadow Walk. Kim magically teleport in dark darkness as a bonus action up to 120 feet yeah yeah a lot of cool stuff there so last question about full metal alchemist before we break d10 what is your favorite scene from fma oh oh god put me in a spot there are a lot of good scenes in fma so this is uh that is a hard pick. All right, well, you think about it. I will give you mine. One of my favorite scenes is one fairly early on, and it's one of the ones that I think really establishes who Ed is. So he's talking to, I think, one of the uh, the characters from Ishbal, and they're talking about the possibility... Oh, Rose? Yeah, that's the one. And they're talking about the the possibility of human transmutation and he just busts out like all the elements that comprise the human body and he's basically like you know it's not that hard and it's not that complex it's just like a great mic drop moment that really kind of gives you know the that the anime is thoughtful about how its casting system works yeah though that was just a facade i'm pretty sure like yeah, it's a great way of uh, characterizing the, the the magic system. But for char- characterizing Ed, he's not nearly that cold or that distant. I mean, yes, he could be that. I mean, yes, he could be that capricious. But well, yeah, but it's it's more to show that he's an expert in what he does, that he's an alchemic prodigy instead of yeah. Know, it's kind of his lo- that that's not really about his logic. It's about his skill. Yeah, I don't know, like yeah, I more go for like. I don't know, uh, scenes that epitomize in a care, uh, a character's, uh, integrity. Like, I don't know, the best one that I can think of off the top of my head, again, this is also early on, like, I think just after, uh, just after, uh, Q's dies, 
Yeah, pour one out. Yeah. For our boy. Uh, Riza and Al are fighting Lust, and they are and is and they are assumed that Mustang is dead. Dead, and Riza is just trying to tell Al to get out of here. Get out of here, run, so they still have this information. But he refuses to let anyone die on his account on his account ever again. Not when he can stop it. Well, yeah, that is and uh, that's, that is a very him scene. And then Mustang sh- shows up in the ta-da nick of time with a cauterized gut wound <laughs> and fucking destroys lust. Man, Mustang. But, what a guy. Yeah. Awesome character basically throughout the entire series. Yeah, such yeah, so awesome. I'm sure there are other sayings later on that also really just make me say, yes, I love that. But unfortunately I cannot think of it at the top of my head. Alright, well, thank you very much for watching this episode of Bonus Damage. If you have any topics you'd like us to cover, please let us know down in the comments. And if you're interested in more tabletop gaming content, check out D6 Damage right here on YouTube. I'm D6. I'm D10. And you've been watching D6 Damage. Oh.